time we've got the third lecture um, now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks Ian. So this is the third and final uh, lecture in the series and um, we've covered the raw <coughs> techniques for coping with computationally hard problems uh, as the first lecture and then uh, later on in the morning we saw how to apply some of those techniques to hard problems arising in the allocation of junior doctors to hospitals and then in this last lecture this afternoon what we're going to have a look at is the kidney exchange problem which again gives rise to hard computational problems but maybe in a slightly different flavour to what we've looked at so far in terms of junior doctor allocation but nevertheless the same kinds of principles apply how can we deal with this computational hardness to try to help people in practical applications. So kidney exchange is all about helping a patient who requires a kidney transplant who has a willing but incompatible donor to maybe swap their donor with another patient who's in a similar position and then the patients will be able to receive a compatible kidney whereas previously they may not have been able to do so. So there are some algorithmic problems contained here but before I talk about those I'll just mention some background to kidney failure so it's obviously a very serious illness and there are two main forms of treatment so dialysis obviously has major lifestyle implications for a patient. They have to visit their local renal dialysis unit typically several times a week, and that might have a great impact on their quality of life. And of course, an alternative is transplantation, which in fact offers much greater long-term survival prospects for the patient. But there's a great shortage of donors. So as of exactly this time last year, there were over 5,200 patients on the active transplant waiting list waiting for a kidney from a deceased donor. And the median waiting time for adults was around 31 months, whilst for children it was about nine and a half months, and that's based on patient registrations over a four year period. Now kidneys certainly can come from deceased donors, and there were over 2,200 transplants from deceased donors over a one year period ending 31st of March last year. But of course kidneys can also come from living donors. Healthy adults have two kidneys, and can often live with no health care implications with just a single kidney and there were over a thousand transplants from living donors over the same one year period which represented around 32% of all donations. But what can complicate living kidney donation is for example a blood type incompatibility. So broadly speaking a donor with blood type A cannot give a kidney to a patient with blood type B. And another reason why a patient might reject a donor kidney is, for example, due to a tissue type incompatibility, sometimes referred to as a positive cross match. So the source of figures on this slide come from the NHS Blood and Transplant Annual Statistical Activity Report from 2016. Now, before the 1st of September 2006, there were restrictions in the UK that limited the possibility of living kidney donation. In particular, if you were a donor, you could go only donate one of your kidneys to a patient if there was a genetic attachment or emotional connection between the donor and the patient. And in particular, what that really meant is that you could only give a kidney to a spouse or a blood relative. But following the introduction of the Human Tissue Act, there's effectively now a legal framework that allows transplants to take place between people who haven't met before. And that's given rise to new possibilities for living kidney donation as follows. So through paired kidney donation, it's possible for a patient who has a willing donor, but that donor is incompatible with them, to swap their donor with another patient who is in a similar position. Previously, if a patient had brought a willing donor who was deemed to be incompatible, then that donor would simply have been sent home and would have been invisible to the healthcare system. But now it's possible for these kinds of swaps to take place. Altruistic donors, sometimes referred to as non-directed or Good Samaritan donors, can also donate a kidney. They may have no particular patient in mind. They want to donate one of their kidneys for reasons that may be very special to them. And in fact, there are many altruistic donors who've come forward, over 500 since the Human Tissue Act was introduced. Altruistic donors can donate directly to the deceased donor waiting list. So that's that big list of over 5,000 patients who are waiting for a donor kidney or they can trigger what are called domino pair donation chains or DPD chains for short and they benefit multiple patients and I'll say more about DPD chains later on. So what I'm going to do first of all is to show you an example of a paired kidney exchange and I'm also calling this a pairwise exchange because it involves two couples 
who swapped their donors. And this is one of the UK's first, which took place between a Portsmouth and Plymouth couple in 2007. So in Plymouth, there was a father-daughter pair. The father required a kidney. His daughter was a willing donor, but unable to denote, donate to him because of an incompatible blood type. Meanwhile, over in Portsmouth, there was a similar situation involving a husband and wife pair, where the wife required a kidney, and her husband was a willing donor, but this time they had a positive cross-match. So the donors were unable to donate the kidney to their intended recipients. But what happened was a pairwise kidney exchange where the daughter from the first couple donated a kidney to the wife from the second couple in exchange for her husband donating a kidney to the father from the first couple. And neither of those two couples had met one another previously. So obviously this idea of two donor-patient pairs exchanging their donors so as to end up with a compatible kidney cannot necessarily or need not be restricted to just two couples. And here's an example of where we have three couples cyclically swapping their donors in order for the patients to receive a compatible kidney. So this was one of the UK's first three-way kidney exchanges which took place in early December 2009. And it involved an Aberdonian husband and wife, and a Hastings brother and sister, and a St Albans husband and wife. And in each case, the patient is represented in blue and the donor in beige. And the arrows here represent the shipment of kidneys. So the husband from the Aberdonian couple donated one of their kidneys to the brother from the Hastings couple in exchange for his sister donating one of her kidneys to the husband from the St Albans couple in exchange for his wife donating one of her kidneys to the Aberdonian uh, member of the couple. Now again, these couples have never met one another previously. The Aberdonian husband and wife were operated on in the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary and the couples from Hastings and St Albans were operated on in London Renal Transplantation Centres. The arrows here represent the transshipment of kidneys, and in particular those two arrows represent kidneys that travel by plane. So London to Edinburgh and Edinburgh to London. What's also worth mentioning is that all of these operations, three nephrectomies and three transplantations, all have to take place on the same day. That's because of the possibility of a donor backing out after their corresponding patient has received a kidney. It's not possible to write a legally binding contract to enforce somebody to donate a human organ, and therefore to avoid the possibility of reneging, then we have to have all of these operations carried out on the same day. And obviously you can imagine that that can give rise to major logistical issues, scheduling six operating theatres and surgical teams all on the same day. So certainly in the early days, these were quite a big deal when they were introduced and they got publicity, for example, this BBC article on that particular three-way exchange which uh, got some attention and the people involved were prepared to be made and that's not always the case. So there are a number of countries around the world where there are matching schemes that attempt to systematically construct optimal solutions consisting of kidney exchanges. And in the United States, there are a number of programs, and here's Al Roth mentioned again, and he has been a leading light in the Alliance for Paired Kidney Donation, which has been running for many years. And there's also the National Kidney Registry, and again, a publication co-authored by Roth on that. But national kidney exchanges in the United States are much more recent and there's now the United Network for Organ Sharing, which is a nationwide scheme. Now most of these schemes have involved constructing pairwise and three-way exchanges, but amazingly there was a longer exchange, in fact an exchange involving six couples that was performed in 2008. And I say amazingly because that would have involved 12 simultaneous operating theatres and surgical teams all lined up on the same day. So that would have been quite a feat to organise. Now, kidney exchange also happens, of course, in many other countries. The Netherlands has the world's longest-running national matching scheme for kidney pair donation. And there are other longer-running schemes, uh, longer-running than, for example, the UK, in <coughs> South Korea, Romania, and Australia. In the UK, we have the National Living Donor Kidney Sharing Schemes, which came into operation in 2007 following the introduction of the Human Tissue Act. And that is run by NHS Blood and Transplant, so our involvement here has been to work with them for around 10 years now in terms of solving the algorithmic problems that are associated with finding optimal solutions, and I'll say more about that shortly. But there's also been more recent uh, inception of matching schemes for paired kidney donation in other countries, 
including these ones here. So it's the transplantation modality that is really beginning to gain a lot of traction in various countries. But in all of these cases for these kidney exchange matching schemes, cycles should be as short as possible. That's a common theme that really needs to be considered because of the logistical implications of, uh, of organizing all of these transplantations that form these exchanges. So what's been our involvement here? Well, we've been interested in how we can model the problem and solve it using efficient algorithms. So we've turned this into a graph theoretic problem where the patient donor pairs the model as vertices in a directed graph. So in this little example here, we can see three donor patient pairs. So this vertex here is supposed to represent DIPI. Donor I is the willing but incompatible donor for patient I. You could, for example, think of maybe donor I as the spouse of patient I. Would like to donate to their spouse but unable to do so maybe because of a blood type incompatibility. And we've got two other donor patient pairs in a similar position. Now the arcs represent potential compatibilities between donors and patients belonging to other couples. So for example, there might be an arc from vertex I to vertex J if donor I is compatible with patient J. So we have such an arc here. We have an arc from donor J to patient K. We also have an arc representing a compatibility between donor K and patient I. So these are examples of arcs in the graph. And immediately, if we define things in this way, we can see that cycles will correspond to potential exchanges. So here is a cycle of length two. We call that a two cycle. And that corresponds to a potential pairwise exchange. So donor I could give a kidney to patient J in exchange for donor J giving one of their kidneys to patient I. And we have an example also of a three-way exchange. So donor J could give a kidney to patient K in exchange for DK giving to PI in exchange for DI giving to PJ. So we have examples of two cycles and three cycles in that graph. And also in a directed graph setting, we can model the likelihood of success of a transplant over priority of a given patient. And we can do that by assigning a score to a given R. So what I've done is I've represented weights by just trying to show these in a crude fashion using the thickness of the arcs in that directed graph. So we can say a little bit more about how these weights might come about. So here is the scoring system that is used by NHS Blood and Transplant, which allows us to actually put a weight or a score against one of these arcs in the underlying graph. So let's suppose that we've got an arc from vertex I to vertex J involving donor patient pairs DIPI and DJPJ. Well then, that score is made up of a number of different constituent components. The first component that contributes to this is waiting time, where the waiting time is 50 multiplied by the number of previous matching runs that the patient PJ has been involved in. So the priority that we're modeling here relates to the patient that would receive the kidney in this hypothetical transplant that may or may not be chosen to take place. So it's possible that a patient may have been involved unsuccessfully in a number of previous matching runs, in which case they're given a higher priority by multiplying by 50 the number of previous unsuccessful runs that they've been involved in. So what I mean by a matching run is where NHS blood and transplant take all the donors and patients on their database, they then execute the algorithm to construct this directed graph, and then the algorithm runs to try and find an optimal solution. And that is done every three months. So every quarter, a matching run takes place. The next constituent component is sensitization points. That's a percentage divided by two. And the percentage is based on a test called the panel reactive antibody test. And that gives rise to a calculated reaction frequency, which basically uh, measures how difficult a patient is to transplant. So formally, what happens is that NHS blood and transplant take a random sample of 10,000 donors from their database who are blood type identical with the patient, and they measure the proportion of antigens that the donors have that are incompatible for that patient. So the higher the proportion of calculated reaction frequency, then the more difficult the patient is to match, the more highly sensitized we call that patient. So the higher the level of sensitization, the higher the priority that they have here. The next component comes from the actual potential transplant between DI and PJ. It measures the level of tissue type and compatibility between them using what's called HLA mismatch levels. HLA stands for human leukocyte antigen. It's a specific test which determines the level of tissue type and compatibility between DI and PJ. And it's measured in terms of 
four types of points, 0, 5, 10, or 15. And the higher the level of tissue type incompatibility, the lower the points on that scale. The next component is donor to donor age difference, where we take the absolute value of the difference between the ages of the donors who would be involved here. And if they differ by almost 20 years, then this is a contribution of three points, otherwise no points. The idea is simply to try to ensure that the, the donors are as close as possible in ages for fairness reasons. And then there's a final discriminator, which actually involves the actual donor to donor age difference, which is normalized so that it contributes at most 0 0.5. So all that is lumped together into a single score, which is then applied to that mark here. OK, so with the directive graph having been constructed and with the scores then being applied to the underlying arcs, then we might ask ourselves what might we want to optimize in terms of the underlying computational problem. So here's an example involving five donor-patient pairs, and we've got some arcs representing potential compatibilities. And here's an example of a three-cycle that's been selected. And that obviously gives us three transplants. So this is an example of what we call a maximal solution, because we can't extend it by adding any additional cycle. If we were to add any additional cycle, then we would violate the property that each vertex must be incident to at most one selected cycle. Now that's pretty important that we don't have a vertex incident to more than one selected cycle, otherwise we would have a donor donating more than one kidney, which could be problematic. Likewise, each patient is going to receive at most one kidney. So with this in mind, that's one potential solution involving three transplants. But here's another where we can actually match everybody. So we've got a two cycle being chosen here. That's a pairwise exchange. And here's a three way exchange. So we can achieve five transplants by choosing a, a slightly different solution. So it looks as if the bottom solution should without question be preferable. But it's not necessarily as obvious as that because we could take into account the weights. And we might have these hypothetical weights on the arcs, which would mean that this solution with three transplants would have a total weight of 250. So that would take into account both the potential for success of the underlying transplants and the priority levels of the patients who are involved. But now, suppose, again, maybe in an extreme example, all the rest of the arcs had a weight of five. And that would mean that the solution with five transplants has a much lower weight than the solution with three transplants. So then we start to see some difficult questions as to whether we should go for a lower number of transplants with a much higher likelihood of success and priority level for the patients involved, or to go with a higher level of transplants but with a lower potential for success. OK, so luckily we don't have to make these difficult decisions. That's decided for us by the kidney advisory group at NHS Blood and Transplant. They are the customer, and we just do what we're told in that respect. But we can define now the optimization problems that we might want to, to study. So in order to define those, I'm going to just introduce some notation and terminology. David, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, just moving your mic. So just for clarity, you're, you actually are trying to maximize the score. Is that right? That is one of the optimality criteria that is of importance to NHS blood and transplant, but it's not the first one. Okay. And there are several optimality criteria that actually come ahead of it. Okay. Uh, but it's, a good, I mean, it's an important question because there is a complicated optimality definition, but in actual fact, I'm not going to show you it because it's a little bit lengthy, but I'm going to give you an idea of the kinds of things that they're looking to optimize. So a set of exchanges can be represented as a permutation, which we call pi, of the vertex set. So if you remember, the vertex set just consists of all these donor-patient pair vertices, and pi is just a way of permuting them into a set of cycles. And we say that we must satisfy the following condition, that if vertex i is not mapped to itself under the permutation, then i, comma pi of i, must be an arc in the underlying graph. So let's just see what is meant by that. So if vertex i is mapped to vertex j under this permutation, that means that di is giving a kidney to pj. And that can only be the case if di is compatible with pj, meaning that i, comma j would have to be an arc in the underlying graph. So that's just saying that these exchanges can only involve edges that actually exist in the graph. Now, if a vertex i is covered, that means that it's not mapped to itself under the permutation. So if a vertex is covered, that means that we've actually got a potential transplant taking place. If, on the other hand, vertex i is mapped to itself under the permutation, then that means that di and pi are not taking part in any exchange. 
the patient is not receiving a, a, a kidney and the donor is not donating. So here's one potential definition of optimality, which is very much contained in the, the larger definition adopted by NHS blood and transplant. So a set of exchanges is called optimal if the first thing that we want to do is to maximize the number of vertices covered by pi, in other words, maximize the number of transplants. And then the second condition is that subject to the first condition, the sum of the weights must be maximum. In other words, the total score of all the arcs that we choose in the exchanges must be maximized. So this is a kind of lexicographic or hierarchical definition because the most important thing is to optimize according to condition one. And then over all solutions that optimize according to condition one, we optimize according to condition two. So what we're going to consider is three cases of this. So there are three different versions of this problem that can be considered by placing restrictions or not placing restrictions on the lengths of the cycles that are allowed in an optimal solution. In our first case, we're going to consider what happens if we allow only pairwise exchanges. And that's actually very relevant because certainly in the early stages of the, the UK scheme, only pairwise exchanges were considered. So it was important to build up clinical experience with carrying out these types of transplants in practice. And that was their starting point. And that is also the starting point of many of the newer schemes across Europe. The second example is where cycle lengths are unrestricted. And that can also be important in practice because there may be reasons why those might happen. And I'll maybe come back to that later on. And the third case, which is important from practical applications as well, is where we allow only pairwise and three-way exchanges. And that's important because actually that's the case at the moment with NHS blood and transplant. Their maximum cycle length is three. All right, so let's start with the case where we only allow pairwise exchanges. So what we're going to do is to show that this problem can actually be solved in polynomial time. So we have a nice uh, example of a matching problem which admits a polynomial time algorithm. So what we do is we take the directed graph D that we saw earlier and we transform it into an undirected graph. And the way we do this is to take every two cycle and replace it by an undirected edge. So what's shown here is an example of directed graph D that could occur in some example application. And this is going to be our transformation. So G is going to be an undirected graph and the vertices are just going to be exactly the same as the vertices in the directed graph. And every time we have a two cycle, we're replacing it by an undirected edge. So for example, there's a two cycle involving D1P1 and D2P2, and there is a corresponding edge between the two vertices in G. So what's the use of forming this undirected graph? Well, we can construct a maximum cardinality matching. So what's a matching? It's a subset of the edges satisfying the property that each vertex in G is incident to at most one of the chosen edges. And again, that's important because, again, each donor must be involved in at most one exchange. So I've shown a maximum cardinality matching here. And we can find a maximum cardinality matching in polynomial time. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But here's the correspondence back in the original directed graph. So there's the undirected edges. And here are the corresponding two cycles that would make up the pairwise exchanges. So that gives us a way of solving the problem of maximizing the size of the solution in polynomial time. But we can also maximize the weight as well, because what we can do is we can set the weight of the undirected edges to be the sum of the weights of the two edges that make up the, the two cycle in the directed graph. So the weight of the edge here would be the sum of the weights of the two arcs here. And that would mean that a set of pairwise exchanges chosen over here would have exactly the same weight as the corresponding two cycles in the original directed graph D. So all that remains is to explain how we can find a maximum weight matching in the undirected graph G. Well, there's an algorithm that can solve that problem in polynomial time. We might not have a bipartite graph, so this could be a, a general graph, but we can find a maximum weight matching in a general graph, nevertheless, in polynomial time. So we have a nice example of at least one version of this problem that can be solved in polynomial time. And at least to begin with, NHS blood and transplant were working only with pairwise exchanges. So let's now move on to the second sub-problem, which is the case where the exchanges are unrestricted in length. We have no upper bound on the maximum length of cycle that is imposed. And again, we can transform this into a matching problem in a graph, but in a slightly different way. 
So let's suppose again that we're starting with our directed graph D, and the transformation is a little bit different this time because what we do is we uncouple the donors from the patients. So let's suppose that we've got this vertex here involving donor patient pair I. Well, we're going to create a separate vertex for donor I and a separate vertex for patient I. And likewise, we can do that with all of the remaining donor patient pairs. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to add arcs, or edges, I should say, in the undirected graph. So, for example, here, in the directed graph D, we have an arc from DI to PJ. So DI is compatible with PJ. And here's the corresponding edge in the undirected graph. Just again representing the fact that DI is compatible with PJ. What we have additionally are vertical edges which have weight zero and those go between a donor and their corresponding will and between a patient and their corresponding will and incompatible donor. What we also have is the weight of these edges here is going to be the same as the weight of the corresponding arcs in the directed graph. So for example, if we had a weight of 2 on that edge here, we would have a weight of 2 on that edge there. So it turns out that once we've got this graph constructed here, it's a bipartite graph. So we've got two disjoint sets of vertices, and every edge joins a vertex in one set to a vertex in the other. And in that uh, bipartite graph, we can construct a perfect matching. And if we try to find a perfect matching of maximum weight, then that is going to correspond to a maximum weight solution in our original directed graph. How can we find a maximum weight perfect matching? Well, again, luckily, the problem is solvable in polynomial time. Again, the same two authors are involved, Gabo and Tarjan, and their paper solves that problem for bipartite graphs even more easily than for general graphs. Let's just illustrate the transformation uh, in an example. So this might be our directed graph, and we've got five donor patient pairs again, and these numbers here are just hypothetical scores that might exist on the arc, so they give us potential weights. And here's our bipartite graph, G, that's undirected. So what we've got is all the donor vertices in the, the top set of vertices, they've been uncoupled from the patient vertices that are occupying the bottom set. And if we were to have a look at that arc there in D, then it has weight 3 going from vertex 1 to vertex 2. And here is the corresponding undirected edge going from vertex 1 or donor 1 to patient 2 in the undirected graph. And that would also have weight 3 in the undirected graph G. Now we've also got vertical edges, and these five vertical edges all have weight 0. So what's the point of the vertical edges? Well, the vertical edges guarantee that we can find a perfect matching. So we can certainly find a perfect matching but just by choosing all of these vertical edges and then we get a total weight of zero. But what we're trying to do is we're obviously trying to do better than that because if we choose all these vertical edges, then nobody's going to be involved in an exchange. Any selection of a vertical edge will mean that a donor and their corresponding patient are not going to be involved in an exchange. So we want to find a perfect matching of maximum weight and in our example, that could mean this choice of edges. So the edges in blue actually represent a potential four-way exchange, an exchange involving four donor-patient pairs. And to show how to trace it out, we can just start at donor vertex 1, for example, and trace out their corresponding edge leading to patient 4. And then we go up to donor 4. So donor 1 is going to give to patient 4 in exchange for donor 4 giving a kidney to patient 5 in exchange for donor 5 giving a kidney to patient 2, in exchange for donor 2 giving a kidney to patient 1, and then we get back to where we started. Meanwhile, donor patient pair 3 is not going to be involved in an exchange. So if we trace it out down here, then we can see how that corresponds to a four cycle or four way exchange up here. And that would be a maximum weight solution, and we can see that it involves donor patient pair 3 not involved in an exchange. So again, unrestricted length exchanges can be dealt with efficiently, and we have a nice polynomial time algorithm to deal with that. So again, so far so good. We haven't actually come up against anything that's hard, but as luck would have it, the problem that we actually want to solve in the UK setting is where things start to become computationally hard. So in the UK setting at the moment, the maximum length of cycle that's allowed is three. Again, because of the logistical problems and uh, all the challenges associated with setting up all the operating theatres and the scheduling and so on with exchanges that have to be uh, scheduled on the same day. 
So if we want to find an optimal set of exchanges involving only two cycles and three cycles, then that problem was shown to be NP-hard by Abraham et al. And it wasn't difficult for us to adapt their reduction to show that the problem was also hard to approximate within some fixed constant. But really, one could argue that approximation algorithms and heuristics are not necessarily worth considering in an application like this anyway, because we don't really want to settle for anything less than optimality unless we absolutely have to. So we'd like to find an optimal solution, but we know that because of the NP-hardness of the problem, we're doomed to an exponential time algorithm in the worst case. But certainly we want to avoid merely trying out all possibilities. We saw this morning that trying out all permutations, for example, are it's going to be a pretty disastrous uh, strategy. So instead, again, here comes integer programming as a way of solving the problem. So I'm going to describe to you an outline of the integer programming model that is used to solve the optimality problem that arises in the UK setting. So we're building on this cycle formulation that was described by Rolf Sundmets and Unber in their paper in 2007 and was first investigated from a computational point of view by Abraham et al. the same year. So what it involves is listing all the possible two cycles and three cycles, which represent pairwise and three-way exchanges, in the directive graph. And suppose we've got this big long list of all those possible cycles, and we enumerate them as C1 up to Cn. So there could be a large number of them, but we can still find them reasonably efficiently using some depth-first search-related uh, algorithm. And we're going to be introducing binary value variables, x1 up to xn. So there's one binary value variable for every cycle. And if xi is true, then it means that cycle ci is selected, and it will be part of an optimal solution. Now what we want to do is to enforce the constraint that each vertex must be incident to a most one selected cycle. So that is basically the main constraint that is important from the point of view of the basic cycle formulation. So we achieve this by a constraint matrix, which has n rows and n columns. So remember that n is the number of donor patient pairs, and n is the number of two cycles and three cycles. And the i-commagate entry of that matrix is 1, if and only if vertex vi is incident to cycle cj. We're then going to introduce an n times 1 vector of 1s, and that will be our bounds to ensure that each vertex is incident to a most one selected cycle. And C is going to be our cost vector. And the values inside that vector will correspond to exactly what we're trying to optimize. So for example, if we want to maximize the number of transplants, then the jth member of the cost vector could be the length of the jth cycle. Just meaning, for example, that a two cycle gives two transplants, and a three cycle gives three. So the optimization problem that we, went, we then want to solve is to maximize C times x subject to Ax is less than or equal to B where x is a binary valued set of variables. So let's see an example of this. All right, so I've got again this directive graph involving five donor patient pairs and some hypothetical arcs between them. And what's shown here is the constraint matrix A. So it's got five rows and seven columns. So first of all, why has it got five rows? Because there are five donor patient pairs. It's got seven columns because there are four two cycles and three three cycles. And we can see exactly why we've got these ones and zeros in the various columns. So for example, cycle C1 is a two cycle involving donor patient pairs one and two. So we have a one in rows one and two of column one. Cycle C2 is a two cycle involving vertices one and three. So we have a one in rows one and three. And if we skip ahead, cycle C5 is a three cycle involving vertices 1, 4, and 2. We can go from 1 to 4 to 2 and back to 1 again. And finally, cycle C7 is a two cycle, three cycle involving vertices 1, 2, 5, and 4. So there we can go from 2 to 5 to 4 and back to 2 again. So that's how the constraint matrix is set up. And then we've got our bounds, a 5 times 1 vector of 1s. And then these are our unknowns. So this is what the integer programming solver is going to have to try and find values for. It's this cost, it's this vector of variables x1 up to x7. And we have our cost vector, and the cost vector gives a contribution of 2 for each 2 cycle and 3 for each 3 cycle. So we're just trying to maximize the number of transplants here in this example. Right, so suppose that we ran this into an integer programming solver, and it might come up with this optimal solution here.
the optimal solution sets x2 to be 1 and x7 to be 1. That means that we're going to be choosing cycle C2 and cycle C7. Cycle C2 involves vertices 1 and 3, and cycle C7 involves vertices 2, 5, and 4. And what we've done is we've achieved an objective value of 5. That's an objective value of 2 from the 2 cycle and 3 from the 3 cycle. In other words, we've matched everybody. So every patient has been involved in an exchange in that particular solution. So that's just an example of what these IP models might typically look like in the kidney exchange setting. When it comes to the optimality criteria adopted by NHS blood and transplant, maximizing the cardinality, the number of transplants is certainly in there. Also, they're maximizing the total weight. But there are other things that are involved as well. And I'll give a flavor of some of the other things that they want to take account of. First of all, they want to mitigate the risk associated with three-way exchanges. So three-way exchanges have more risk associated with them than two-way exchanges or pairwise exchanges. So three-way exchanges involve six people, and it just takes one of those people to become ill for the whole thing to break down. Compare that to pairwise exchanges that involve four people. So we might want to minimize the use of three-way exchanges where possible. And we might be able to do that because, for example, if we have an optimal solution involving six transplants, it could be made up in different ways. It could be made up by choosing three pairwise exchanges or two three-way exchanges. So if we have a choice, we should prioritize the solution on the left-hand side because it doesn't use any three-way exchanges. And so we're using only pairwise exchanges, each of which involve fewer people. Another thing we can do to mitigate the risk associated with three-way exchanges is to prioritize special kinds of three-way exchanges which have fault tolerance. And what I mean by fault tolerance is the existence of a back arc. So a back arc is an arc that goes in the opposite direction to the direction of the three cycle. So here's an example of a three-way exchange which has a back arc. So it goes from D1P1 to D2P2 to D3P3, back to D1P1. But there's an arc in the opposite direction going from D3P3 to D2P2. And the reason that this is important is because it might be the case that either D1 or P1 became ill. And if they become ill, then the three-way exchange would break down and it can't be completed. But still, it enables NHS blood and transplant to potentially salvage something from what remains. They might be able to conduct a pairwise exchange from the remaining donor patient pairs that might still be fit for transplant. So these types of three-way exchanges are prioritized in the optimality definition because they give us a level of fault tolerance. And there have been many examples, in fact, over the years of where three-way exchanges have fallen apart, but yet they've been able to salvage pairwise exchanges from the embedded uh, usage of back arcs. Now, I mentioned earlier that altruistic donors can trigger what are called domino pair donation chains. So I'm going to say a little bit more about that now. So an altruistic donor, remember, is someone who wants to give a kidney but doesn't have a corresponding patient in mind. So what they could do is they could donate a kidney directly to a patient on the deceased donor waiting list. And since there are over 5,000 of such patients, there's bound to be an excellent match for that altruistic donor. So they would benefit a single patient, and that would be a, a super thing to happen. But in fact, if they were prepared to perhaps wait a little bit longer and wait for the next matching run of the NLD KSS, then they could actually benefit multiple patients. Because it's possible that A1 could give a kidney to this patient P3 in exchange for their willing but incompatible donor donating a kidney to the deceased donor waiting list. And there, they triggered a chain benefiting two patients. That's what NHSBT call a short chain. But in fact, the idea can be extended, so there could be more than one donor patient pair in the middle, and we could have what they call a long chain. So altruistic donor A2 donates a kidney to P4 in exchange for their donor donating to P5 in exchange for their donor donating to the deceased donor waiting list. So how can we model these short and long chains? Well, we can do this by creating dummy patients for altruistic donors who are automatically compatible with every non-altruistic donor. And that allows us to close the loop and effectively consider short and long chains as two cycles and three cycles, respectively. And here's what it would look like in the underlying directed graph. So there's altruistic donor A1, compatible with P3 from before, and there's A2, compatible with P4, and D4, compatible with P5. So now I'm going to add in these implicit arcs that go back from the non-altruistic donors to the dummy recipients of altruistic donors.
And once we've got those implicit arcs added into the directive graph, then we can search for two cycles and three cycles as before, uh, just with the proviso that there's at most one altruistic donor selected per cycle. So we can also deal with these types of domino pair donation chains. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the implementation details. So when it comes to formulating these integer programming problems, we also have to think about how we're going to solve them. And there are lots of different IP solvers available. Some of them are free of charge and open source. Others come with licenses that have to be purchased. And it can be a significant difference in performance, such as illustrated by this bar chart here, which compares different IP solvers, some of which have commercial uh, licenses which can cost quite a lot of money, such as Cplex and Grobe, and others such as Coin Branch and Cup, which are freely available. So, for commercial licenses, easily uh, the charge could be over 100,000 euros. So, uh, when it came to deployment for NHSBT, we opted for Coin CBC, which doesn't have the best performance, but it's certainly a good one uh, when considering the open source solvers. Now, CoinCBC is based on C++, so the software was implemented in the same language, and it also uses the Levin graph library, which was contributed by researchers in Budapest, for graph matching algorithms. It's been deployed as a web service using Ruby on Rails, and also uses the Google test framework. So, it takes input data in the form of either XML or JSON, and produces output data in a similar format, and there's also versions that can be deployed on different platforms. So there's a demonstration version hosted at this URL here, which I'm just going to illustrate to you. And it's able to certainly work with data sets that have emerged from the NHS blood and transplant matching runs. And so far, so good. It's running in another three seconds for all the real data sets that we've had today. But it's very important not to be complacent about that for reasons that I'll talk about later. First of all, though, I'll just show you the user interface from this uh, web application. So it has a web form where we can just paste in some data, and the data here is shown in JSON notation. So what this says is that donor 1 is the willing but incompatible donor for patient 1, and the notation actually allows for that donor to be a willing donor for multiple patients. This donor has an age of 45, and then we get a list of all the recipients that that donor is compatible with. So the donor, for example, is compatible with recipient 30 with a score of 29. So that's just some artificially generated data, and then we can specify what we want to optimize, and we can specify the maximum length of domino pair donation chain. And then we can press the button, and we get an optimal solution depending on what we've asked for. So we get some information about the underlying directed graph. It tells us the number of two cycles and three cycles. Now, of course, many of these are overlapping, so they can't all be chosen. But in the optimal solution that was generated here, we had a total of 54 transplants that was made up through 12 pairwise exchanges and 10 three-way exchanges. Some of these two ways were, in fact, actually short chains triggered by altruistic donors. So the short chains triggered by altruistic donors are represented by the, the two cycles that actually have red shading uh, with the donor involved at the start. And then the rest of them are pairwise exchanges, and then we come to some three-way exchanges, and some of these are highlighted, and those are the ones that have a back arc. And it also lists all the possible two cycles and three cycles in the underlying graph. Now I can show you some results, some statistical summaries of recent NHS blood and transplant matching runs. So if we look at, for example, the 2015 October matching run, there were 259 donor patient pairs involved and seven altruistic donors, a total of over 5,200 arcs in the underlying directed graph. So that represented all the potential compatibilities between donors and recipients. We had a total of 374 two cycles and over 3,000 three cycles. So a huge number of cycles, and that actually represents a good measure of the complexity of the underlying IP model, because those correspond to the variables whose values have to be chosen. Now again, lots of these were overlapping, so we can't just choose them all. But in an optimal solution, there were 72 transplants that were obtained through three pairwise exchanges, no short chains, 15 three-way exchanges, and seven long chains. And the total weight was over 5,700. 
Now, unfortunately, not all of these identified transplants go forward to surgery, and there are a number of reasons for this, including the fact that last-minute incompatibilities might be discovered. So the process of virtual cross-matching happens prior to the matching run being taken uh, into consideration. So virtual cross-matching means that this idea of HLA incompatibility is estimated and then the laboratory cross-matching, where more reliable tissue typing is done, happens after the matching run has been completed. And that might mean that some incompatibilities are detected that were not previously present. Also, another reason why these uh, uh, three cycles and uh, two cycles and so on might fall apart is because a donor or recipient might become too ill for transplant, unfortunately, after the cycle has been identified. Nevertheless, in that particular matching run, a large proportion of those identified transplants did go ahead. There were 57 of them that actually took place, two pairwise exchanges, one short chain, 11 three-way exchanges, and six long chains. So that was a good conversion rate from that particular matching run. So here's a visualization of the underlying directed graph. And I give an acknowledgment here to Tommy Muggleton, who was a former master's student who worked with me and what he did was he produced as part of this project a visualization using June of the underlying digraph. Now, in the July 2015 data set, there was a huge number of vertices, and basically we get this huge clump. It's very difficult to actually identify all of the edges involved. But it's certainly possible to visualize the optimal solution that was encountered, because what we were able to do is to drag the cycles to the edge of the graph so we get a much better idea as to what it looks like. So here we can see an example of a pairwise exchange, here's a three-way exchange, and here's a long chain triggered by an altruistic donor. And all of these pink vertices in the middle are donor-patient pairs who are not involved in any exchange. And here are two altruistic donors who unfortunately were not selected. That's quite unusual because it's usually the case that you will find either a short or long chain involving them. But these are certainly not lost because they will just donate directly to the deceased donor waiting list. So to give a summary of all of the results that actually emerged so far, just to remind you about altruistic donors. So they were introduced into the scheme since January 2012. So prior to January 2012, they could donate directly to the deceased on the waiting list. But from that matching run onwards, they were allowed to trigger short chains. And then once the clinical experience built up from April 2015 onwards, uh, long chains were introduced in addition. So that's where we are at the moment. So from the inception of the scheme, over 1,000 transplants have been identified, made up through this breakdown into pairwise and three-way exchanges, short and long chains. And if we look at the actual transplants that have proceeded to surgery, then it's 679 so far. And again, we can see the breakdown in terms of the different cycles and exchanges. So the conversion rate, if we take the data up to the October 2016 matching run, is 66% which certainly compares favorably to uh, other matching schemes. I've just left it at October 2016 because we don't have the final results yet for the January 2017 matching run. Now, NHS blood and transplant are uh, quite often looking at the optimality criteria and wanting to determine whether uh, changes to the optimality criteria might have certain effects uh, that would help them to analyze whether uh, they might want to modify what is actually being optimized. So what can be useful is to have a way of being able to see the effect of modifying optimality criteria on various different measures, such as the number of transplants or the weight of the associated exchanges. If we were to change the optimality criteria involving changes to actually the underlying code, then that could be quite a cumbersome thing to have to do. It would be much better if we could produce an application that would allow us to change the order of the constraints or specify new constraints and swap things in and out in order to see the outcome or the effect on these different measures. Also, uh, what would be useful is an application to allow us to actually dynamically create new constraints as well. So I introduced this application here, which uh, was uh, again programmed by Greg O'Malley, who was a former research associate working with me. He was also responsible for the earlier web application that I demonstrated for single runs. So this data analysis toolkit allows us again to paste data into this form. And what we have below are a whole range of different matching runs that can be created. 
So these different matching runs can then be compared against one another to look at the effect on, say, the number of transplants or the weight of the associated solution. And for each of these, we can toggle certain parameters, such as the maximum length of cycle, the maximum length of chain, and then we can specify exactly what we want to optimize and in what order. So we might want to maximize the number of transplants and subject to that maximize the total weight, or do something else. And we can set up a number of these different types of runs, and then we can press a button, and we can see a summary <coughs> of exactly what the outcomes would be. So if we compare the results of three different runs, for example, we can see how that might impact on the number of transplants, the number that results from paired exchanges, the number that results from domino paired donation chains, the number of altruistic donors who are unused, and so on. So that can help us to try to inform the discussions that the kidney advisory group might have at NHS Blood and Transplant to see if what they're optimizing is still exactly what they want to do. So another thing that I want to tell you about, just uh, approaching the end of this, is about incentive compatibility. So Steve earlier mentioned this question about whether residents in junior doctor allocation could have an incentive to perhaps misrepresent their true preferences. And again, there's incentive compatibility questions here, because it might be the case that a hospital has an incentive not to report all of their pairs to a national matching scheme. They might want to withhold their easiest to match pairs, thereby perhaps getting better surgical outcomes themselves, and they report perhaps only their hardest to match pairs to a national scheme. What that would mean is that patients who are at other hospitals may not be able to obtain a transplant because they may only have been able to obtain a transplant perhaps from the hospital's patients that had been withheld. And to show an example of this, I'm just going to show you this setup here where we have three hospitals. Let's call that Hospital A, this is Hospital B, and this is Hospital C. And let's suppose that Hospital A has two donor patient pairs and hospital B has one donor patient pair, and hospital C has this donor patient pair here. Now, if all three hospitals were reporting truthfully all of their pairs to a national scheme, then we could have two pairwise exchanges, and that would involve those two that I've highlighted. However, let's suppose that hospital A sees that actually these two here would be a good match, and to improve its surgical outcomes, it would just prefer to deal with them in-house. So then hospital A doesn't report any pairs to the national scheme and hospitals B and C then aren't able to transplant their patients. So there are incentive compatibility problems, particularly in the United States, where there's been a lot of work done on trying to incentivize hospitals to behave truthfully and to report all of their pairs to a national scheme. Luckily, in this country, it's not an issue because from the very beginning, the National Living Donor Kidney Sharing Schemes has been set up as a national scheme and all the hospitals are working within it, reporting all their pairs. Okay, one of the other last things I want to tell you about is NEAD chains. So NEAD stands for Non-Simultaneous Extended Altruistic Donor Chains, and these are triggered again by altruistic donors, and these are quite similar to domino pair donation chains. They differ because the final donor does not donate directly to the deceased donor waiting list, but instead acts as a bridge donor, and is held over to the next matching run. So D3 becomes essentially an altruistic donor and then triggers another chain at the next matching run. And likewise, the final donor here, instead of donating to the deceased donor waiting list, again takes the role of an altruistic donor and triggers a further chain. So actually, these chains may never terminate, and that's why they're sometimes referred to as never-ending altruistic donor chains. And what I've shown here is an example where the chain segments happen to have the same length, but they don't need to have the same length. So these are important because whilst they could have quite a, a long length, these different chain segments, they can be allowed because all of the transplants associated with them don't have to take place simultaneously. So there's less risk involved with non-simultaneous surgery, which allows us to have longer chains. And if we're modeling these chains as cycles, then that is another reason why the unrestricted cycle length problem that I mentioned right at the beginning could also be an interesting problem to study. What I'm also going to mention briefly is a new cost action project that has recently started called the European Network for Collaboration on Kidney Exchange Programs, which I'm involved in. 
And the idea behind this is to bring together a number of different types of individual policy makers, clinicians, and optimization experts to try to come together and exchange best practice on national kidney exchange programs to help countries that already have kidney exchange programs set up to learn from good practice elsewhere and also to help countries that don't yet have kidney exchange programs set up. So the idea is to develop some common framework for representing data and common optimality criteria such that we could actually develop and test a prototype transnational kidney exchange program. And ultimately, the idea is to start off the European policy dialogue to achieve our long-term aim of actually setting up a European kidney exchange program. So, so far, we have 23 participating countries. That's the duration of the project. The funding is available for meetings, uh, networking to take place. And this is the, the map of countries involved. Hopefully, circumstances will allow the UK to continue to be involved. And I will just finish now with some future work. So longer chains are certainly something that might be on the horizon for NHS blood and transplant because they might arise through never-ending altruistic donor chains. So because these transplants don't have to take place simultaneously, we could end up with a situation where we're searching for chains that are longer than just long chains or length three chains as at present. So the longer the chains, the more complex the optimization problem is. And another reason why the optimization problem might become more complex is because of pool sharing. So if there is transnational collaboration, perhaps as envisaged by the NCAP project, then pools from different countries might come together. Certainly the larger the pools, the, the more of a potential benefit for patients and donors. And that will, again, lead to more complex optimization problems. So to try to cope with this, we need to always be one step ahead and consider new integer programming formulations. So we have some new formulations based on what we call the position index chain formulation, which handles specifically longer length altruistic donor chains. And we want to combine that with the use of more sophisticated techniques involving call generation and branching price to enable us to scale up our integer programming solutions. So at this point, I will stop and I will acknowledge the collaboration that we've had with our colleagues at NHS Blood and Transplant and I'd like to thank everyone for staying with me and for uh, sparing your time again close to the project submission deadline. So thank you very much.